Hi and welcome to this video where we visit Croft Moraig, a notable prehistoric stone circle located near Aberfeldy in Perthshire, Scotland. Like so many Neolithic monuments we have visited over the years, this stone circle has seen multi-phased construction, indicates of its prolonged use and significance. This area must have been so important to our ancestors. I am sure this stone circle has been visited by many over the years, including Orby Burl. For those who haven't heard of Orby Burl before, he is a British archaeologist renowned for his experts in prehistoric stone circles and megalithic monuments. His research and extensive field work has significantly contributed to our understanding of ancient ceremonial sites in Britain and Ireland. He was the author of numerous books and articles presenting details of stone circles such as Stonehenge and Avery and exploring their social, cultural and astronomical significances. His work often combined archaeological evidence with folklore and historical records offering a comprehensive view of the prehistoric landscapes. His contributions have left a lasting impact on the field of archaeology, influencing both research and public interest in ancient monuments. He mentions this stone circle in his book, The Stone Circles of the British Isles, which was first published in 1976. This stone circle was excavated in 1965. It was found that there were three phases of construction to this monument. The first phase being 14 timber post. There seems to be no age of when this first monument started. But we have seen this before like monuments like the sanctuary in Wiltshire, started with a small wooden post thought to have been a hut although that is just a thought, and in turn it grew, between wooden posts and later stones, although nothing remains of the sanctuary monument now. But here the arrangements of the wooden posts are different, for they were arranged in a horseshoe pattern measuring around 8 metres by 7 metres. The mouth of the horseshoe had a post set just inside it, and in the centre of the horseshoe there was a boulder with some burnt bone near it. The opening of the horseshoe faced towards the south and there was a shallow ditch around it. Like many other wooden monuments, as nothing remains it is just a little unsure if this had a roof or not. Burl also mentions in his book that he had no idea if the posts were painted or carved something I had never thought about before when I looked at other wooden monuments and an interesting thought indeed. But he also mentions about the roof and draws an example of a nearby stone built shrine. I tried looking it up but there does seem to be many and I can only think this is the type of shrine he was talking about. Why he mentions this is a tale of women thatching and unthatching the shrine it seems it could have been a yearly event, used for sacred sites and no man was permitted. This one is said to have been the shrine to the mother goddess, but it does seem that these huts were still in use during the late 1700s, where the inhabitants would re-thatch the huts, repair the walls and bring the family out to watch over the herds. When the herd moved back down in the winter, the family would seal up the house until the following year. If this is what Burlitt was talking about, then it could have been an earlier version, possibly. But sadly, we will never know, for nothing remains of this first phase. We also don't know how high the timber posts were or how thick they were. Could the post even be strong enough to hold a roof thatched or not? Burl also mentions that this phase may resemble some of the southern wooden circles, but mainly Bleasdale Timber Circle in Lancashire. Looking the circle up, I can see why he thinks like this, and I will put some links in the description below. 
let me know in the comments what you think and if you have been to this Bleasdale Circle. What we do know is that the timber posts were arranged in a horseshoe shape, that in the second phase these 14 posts were replaced by a horseshoe setting of 8 standing stones, about 8 metres by 6 metres. This was surrounded by a stone bank about 17 metres in diameter. On top of the bank, to the southwest, was a 2 metre stone with 23 cup marks on it. These cup marks is something we'll look into in the future. This vase was dated and provided by some shards of pottery, dating it to around 2000 BC. The third phase, which was the final phase, is a circle of 12 standing stones, about 12 metres in diameter, was erected around the horseshoe. There was an entrance in the southeast marked by two external stones and two adjacent graves. Small quartz stones have also been found within the circle. Not sure how many, but someone described it as a scattering of quartz. But how much of the floor was scattered with these stones back in the Neolithic period or Bronze Age time, we don't know. Also, this isn't something new as I have mentioned similar things about the one of the Fortingale stone circles, which isn't that far away. These lesser known stone circles are amazing to visit, and when we look into their history it's amazing what we can find, and yet leaves us with more questions waiting to be answered. What could be the reason for the wooden horseshoe shaped monument in phase 1? For as far as I'm aware, it is not a common style or wooden monument, but with this thought, it is on the list of things to look into. And to me, this is why these lesser known stone circles are just as important as monuments like Stonehenge, Avebury or the Ring of Bodka. Although places like this do take some imagination to envision what the Neolithic monuments might have looked like in their prime, the structures we see today are often weathered, partially ruined and obscured by the passage of time. However, by considering archaeological findings, historical content and modern reconstructions, we gain a better understanding of their original appearance and purpose. They could have featured polished stones, possibly painted or adorned with carvings, and like here, started or even have been surrounded by wooden structures or earthworks that have since eroded away. Imagining these sites in their full glory involves considering the material and construction techniques used by the Neolithic people, their cultural and religious practices, the natural landscape that surrounds them. Additionally, the communal effort required to building these monuments indicate a highly organised society with complex social structures. The monuments served not only just a place of ritual and worship, but also as centres of community gathering and possibly markers of boundaries. Overall, while we can never be entirely certain of every detail, a combination of archaeological evidence an imaginative reconstruction allows us to appreciate the grandeur and significance of Neolithic monuments in their original context. I will leave this stone circle here and leave the last few words to Aubrey Bell's book. He writes, Croft Moray is one of the most informative stone circles of the British Isles. Its Neolithic timber rings is one of the earliest known and may have affinities with the tradition that caused east-west lines to be incorporated into many earlier stone circles. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing for more contents like this, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you'll never miss an update. A huge thank you to the patrons and to those who have bought me a coffee, for their continued support. 
Your contributions help make these videos possible. If you like to support the channel, the links are in the description below. Thanks again for watching and until the next time, stay safe.